sometimes feel a bit puzzling. Maybe it's that confusing car insurance policy. Or working out the right protection for your health, home and family. Or feeling unsure if your pension is on the right path. Aviva can help make these conundrums click. Helping solve your financial puzzles? It takes Aviva. Is what you're doing still doing it for you? I am EY. For a purpose that inspires me. And a culture that accepts. For a team that relies on me and makes me better for it. Knowing I'm always respected for being absolutely me. For my work to have meaning. Ideas becoming actions and my direction my own. For leaders that challenge, guide and support. Empowering me to be all I can and bring everything I am. My skills accelerated. My voice amplified. For always feeling heard and saying without hesitation. I love what I do. That's why. EY. Mom, I got the job! She got the job! Who got the job? <laughs> She got the job. She got the job. <laughs> Find your I got the job job on Total Jobs. My name is Johan Langren. Uh, I'm CEO of EasyJet. We employ about 15,000 people and we are one of the largest airlines in Europe and in the world actually. We make an impact on young people by actually offering something that makes products and services and connectivity accessible for basically more or less everyone and we're exceptionally proud about that. This is my Do a Flip where you will learn about my career journey, my industry, and also some other things that might be interesting in this conversation that I'm going to have with young Jack. Thanks for having me over, Jack. How are you? I'm very f good, thank you. And I've got my uh, peppermint tea, you've got your coffee, and we're ready for a fantastic chat. Absolutely. So thank you for giving your time today to come yeah, over. No, thank you for having me. You're welcome. I, we always start here because it's really fascinating. We'll have young people tuning in across the country, different walks of life, different stages, wanting to learn a little bit more. So tell us a little bit about your career journey in 60 seconds. Oh, in 60 seconds. Oh, in 60 right, seconds. Okay. You know what? If you go over it, it doesn't matter. We've not, yeah. got, a, we've not got one of those um, yeah. bells or anything. But to share a little bit about your career in 60 seconds. Yeah. I think it's going to be less than 60 seconds. Cool. Let's actually, do it. Yeah, then. yeah. No, listen. I, I grew up and I, I decided very early on that I was going to be a solo trombone player in classical music, which is kind of odd, but it was an event that led to that. I was with my mother uh, when I was 11 years old and I saw a classical concert for the first time in my life and I was sitting next to the stage where this trombone player played and I was literally, literally blown away. And I said to my mother, took her hand and I said, look, that's what I want to do. And my mother was one of those people, she was, she was probably a little bit different than most mothers, but she said, of course. If I would have told her I'm going to be an astronaut, she would have said, of course you can be an astronaut, be a good astronaut. So I said, I'm going to be a solo trombone player. Okay, so yeah, let's go ahead and do that. And we were trying to rent the trombone. So I dedicated myself, you know, the teenage year to really become a classical trombone player. Now, I didn't make that. I didn't come into the, you know, the final audition into Royal Academy of Music in Stockholm, which was really one of the top schools at that point in time. So I was really hurt and, and slightly traumatized by that. So I did sit down and, and said, look, what am I going to do now with my life? And I, I, I wrote down, look, I, I like people. I'm curious about people. I'm curious about myself. I'm curious about individuals and how people think and how they act. And I like to travel. And that sounds like the travel business. So I then, uh, that's a different story, but I, then I then uh, applied for a job within the travel sector and I have continued to work in that sector all along. Wow, wow. And what made, what made you in that, sitting in that seat with your, with your mum going, I want to be like that? 
what made it, what was it about the music and the classical music that made you want to take that pathway? Yes, it, it was a trombone concert and, and it was actually, I think it was playing a, at Warshak, it was a cello concert, uh, con concert that was made in for trombone. It was something about it, that if you never have heard a classical orchestra live, it's the range of the emotions that I think it brought up to me that was just so outstanding. First of all, it's like 100 musicians on stage and you're sitting close to it and it was the power of it that just literally, you know, took me by, by surprise and I was pretty shocked at it. Uh, and then I just thought it was so beautiful and it was also very technical and it was something about you know, a little bit of a, oh, to be that person, to be the, and I wanted to become a soloist. I, you know, that was the whole thing. It sounds very egocentric that I wanted to be that, that person. But yeah, I think the music was the overwhelming thing about it. And do you think it's important for young people to go out and find things that uh, grabs their attention when it comes to choosing what careers they want to get into? Or how do you go, how would you, what is your advice to young people to navigate in terms of what industry should I get into? What career should I do? How do they find their selves in terms of their careers? Because yeah. they see all these footballers on TV, they might see uh, movie stars. Where, where does the inspiration come from, do you believe? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's obviously individually uh, different, but I, I, have, I, I, I never uh, was very keen on the work on, you know, and the thinking about plan your career. And I know we, we talk about that internally in our company and, and, you know, a lot of people say, oh, you have to plan your career. I was always much more keen to enjoy the journey that I was on. I, I didn't set up a destination or, I know some people would say, look, I'm going to become a managing director before this and this and this. And I, I never inspired to that because, you know, some people who said, look, I'm going to, make perhaps a million and I'm going to do this. I mean, they're happy for about a day and then just that goes away. And if you don't make it, you're going to be also then, you know, unhappy because you didn't make it. But if you enjoy the journey that you are on, on that day and the opportunities and the challenges that you are faced with then, I think most stuff will look after itself because it is about that journey, I think. Um, and, you know, um, my father died at a, a relatively early age, I was 11 at that point in time. So I think it, it, it taught us in, in our small family, with my mother and my, my older brother and myself, and, and to, to, you have to live really for the day and for what life gives you on that day, without being reckless about it, of course. Uh, but I do think that, that today is what really matters. And, and without being reckless about it because, and, and some people will think it's good to have a plan and to have a goal in five years and in 10 years as well, but it's never in, caught my attention that much. I agree, focus on today. Yeah. Don't worry about 10 years. If you said to me 10 years ago when I was uh, in school, this is what I'd be doing sitting here yeah. with you, you, you just can't, yeah. you just can't predict yeah. it. Yeah. So, and, yeah, I agree with you. And the same thing with myself as well, you know, yeah. And also when I then didn't make that career in music, um, I was hard, I was tough. I, I, I felt, you know, I had, my mother had, you know, taken her money that she had and dedicated into my career. And I was here in London and I was in, in the US and I had scholarships and, and I worked like four or five, played four or five hours per day and dedicated my life. And I wasn't good enough. I didn't make it. And, and then you realize, have I thrown that away? And have I, you know, sacrificed the whole thing? And you realize that, well, it's up to you to determine if you did sacrifice. What did I learn about? A lot of discipline, getting up in the morning and do what you need to do in order of, of what you want to do. You met some amazing people and you got to know music. And actually, because I knew music quite a lot, and particularly Russian music, that was the reason why I actually got my first job. So it was worthwhile, but not in the way I thought about it at that point the in time. transferable skills. Yes, exactly, exactly. And so I'm just thinking there will be a lot of young people, they recently got their results or their um, school results or their exam results and some obviously didn't pass and they're unmotivated. How does one, in your situation when you, you didn't make the final, you didn't get to the next stage, how does one get back up and move forward? 
How, how, what can young people, what is your free tips for young people to get up, move forward when they have a moment of a wobble? Mm. I'm a big believer, if someone's hurt, let them mourn. Yeah. But then get, before you say to them, dust yourself off, let them mourn for a moment. Yeah. Then get up and then move forward. What's your advice to young people who are, are kind of having a struggle at the moment to yeah, move th forward? This sounds easier than it actually is, but let's elaborate a little bit on that. I, I, I'm a firm believer that if you want to... And most people want to make a difference for good. I mean, there's hardly anybody you meet out there and you scratch underneath the surface and say, look, you know, you know, everybody wants to do well, most people. You know, that's what I think we're instinctively born to do as well. And everybody knows that if I want to do well, I want to be, you know, relatively good at it. Here's the thing that to be good at something, you know, that 10,000 hour rule helps. If you do a lot of it, you will become pretty good at it. I, for myself, I never, never was, you know, the, the smartest person in the room. I'm not today either, by the way. But I've done what I've done for a long time. And I picked up and I worked my hours. And if you've got to do that, you have to enjoy this. You have to be thinking that, look, this is well spent. This life is well spent doing what I'm doing. Because I, I would have thought about it. It's got to be fun. It's got to be developing. And it's got to be rewarding in the broader sense that I, look, I feel fulfilled about what I'm doing. So you got to find what you really, really are passionate about. Doesn't matter what job you are doing. If it is football, great for you. But if it is something else, if it is in engineering, if it is in some administration work, but do it to the best of your ability because you are going to do it for many, many hours a day. And if you only have one life, and we might be surprised, you and I, that there yeah. was, it comes something else after this life. But if you only have one life and one shot at it, why don't you take out those waking hours you have every day, 16 hours, 18 hours, whatever it is, to actually say, well, I'm going to do something that I actually do enjoy. So you've got to find something you're passionate about. The trick is, to know, how do you find that? Because it's easy to say, and, and I think that's one of the things that you can sometimes see and that people are struggling with with motivation because I don't know what, what, what excites me. I, I can't find that. And I think one technique, at least that I've had, is to say, look, I'm going to dedicate myself to this for three months or a month or a year. So it's, if I don't like, it's not going to be the end of it. It's not going to define me what I'm doing the rest of my life. But I am going to dedicate myself and I'm going to be curious and I want to learn out of the whole thing. And then you'll find that out much quicker than if you're desktop researching on that show. Oh, could that be me? Oh, could that be me? Could that be me? Get onto it. Get onto it. Yeah. Don't try and wait for the perfect job. Go and give it a go. Do your hours. Do your and, hours. And do your hours. Yeah. And talking about do, doing your hours. Yes. Yeah. How important is that? Because I'm smiling. Because <laughs> I, I, smile as well. I might think where this is leading to. I, I'm smiling because, yeah. you know what? You don't always see the hours that people have put into 30 years career yeah. that you've put in. And I know you become a young CEO and we're going we're gonna to talk about that in a bit. But putting your hours in, how important is that? And why are we currently, in my opinion, from the data that I've seen, yeah. why are we currently in an era where doing things for five minutes, you don't get the results, you either give up or you demand or get entitled? Yeah, yeah, yeah. How I, can... I, you, you see what I'm saying? Yeah, I, I, I get it completely. It's so interesting and it's well, well articulated, the whole thing. I think that, uh, let me start on the, with the easy part of that question. Yes, it does matter. Doing the hours does matter. There is no doubt that if you come into situations where you are better prepared, have thought it through more, that's going to come through. And it just needs that thing that actually you have. I mean, I still to this day, when we have meetings in my work and we're sending out material, I, I read them really carefully. And I expect everybody to read them carefully. I expect everybody to come in a situation that they have not only read the material, if there's something in there that they don't understand, they need to sort that out beforehand with the individual who knows more about this, instead of taking up times of other people who then actually did understand that whole thing. And the preparedness is so, it's a, it's a gift. It's an absolute, it's like you're running a 100 meters race. But you, don't, you only have to do 80 meters because you better prepare the rest. And everybody can do that. 
That's not about how bright you are or talented you are. It's about actually how much you dedicate your time. And the reason why that matters is then, of course, that then you have to like what you're doing. Because otherwise, it's just going to feel like, oh, this is a prison. i got to do it. It feels like a chore, isn't it? Exactly. So then on to the more difficult question is to say that, look, why, why is it that we have this thing today where we... We, 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 we give up so easily uh, and we don't have, you know, we talked about before the interview also that, that resilience that exists in there as well. And I think it's down to partly I don't think social media helps because I think you're, you're getting so much noise. We're seeing so many amazing, beautiful stories about life that achieved X, Y, and Z because that's mostly what people are putting up on the social media. And you're trying to compare that to your life. You see there's a discrepancy in here. Why am I not doing there? And even if your part of your brain tells you that everybody knows this, you aspire to something that isn't necessarily desirable. And it's necessarily not right for you. So my view has always been to say, you know, cut through that whole thing and let it be okay that actually it is boring for a while, it is tedious for a while, but I will enjoy the journey because I will pick up things along this way that will help me in any case. If I do something that I don't find meaningful, give it another go. Try to see if there's something in here that I can pick up for different reasons at a later stage without just saying that, look, that's it, I'm going to try on to something else. Because if you do that, Here's the other thing that's going to happen, and, and you will know that. You're scratching the surface on a lot of other things. And that might be okay for a while, but after a while, you don't actually know something about things that really matter. That's why I think it helps to be a little bit nerdy about stuff, to dive into something on that, because I think that that helps you, and, and that will give you that, that, that interest most of the time. But I think that... You have to, you, in, in your mind and in your thoughts, you know, we've, you know, talked about that as well. You know, I don't think that you are necessarily your thoughts. I, I can sit and you know, feel that, oh gosh, today is a oh, dreadful day. I got to do this and I don't feel like it as well. So that's my instinct. But I am not those thoughts. I can control my thoughts to say, look, I'm here for a greater purpose. I need to try to achieve something now. Let's just turn those thoughts around to say, no, I am going to do it. I'm going to do it to the best of what I can. And I'm going to take something out of that as well. Those thoughts, you can push them out. And it's not necessarily that you're trying to avoid what you're actually feeling and thinking. And of course, if you're into certain periods of life which are tough and you, you have difficult experiences to deal with, those can be more overwhelming. But in general, it helps to know that I am not my thoughts. And if you're going in to say that, well, I'll try this and I don't like that, don't let that I don't like that necessarily be, you know, the overruling thing. I met the person one who said to me, it was actually a, 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 a trombone teacher that I had, and I had seen a concert, and I, I sort of, oh, I thought that was crap. You know, I didn't think that the person played well, and yeah, I didn't like to enjoy that. He said, so there was nothing on those two hours you didn't like? Well, I, I just thought it was good. So there was nothing. You didn't like the piece. You didn't like the cellist playing. You didn't like the arena. There was nothing you enjoyed about that. And he said something. I can't remember what he said. But, you know, the, the, you, you recognized amateurs. And he used amateurs in the way to say people who are not very, you know, gifted and everything like that. Because of their lack of, of um, admiration because of their lack of curiosity, because of their lack of not finding the things to work out. So he said, you could have gone in there and you said, you know, what a beautiful arena this is. Yeah, not be to my taste over there. Or what a great trumpet player over there. I don't like that part, you know. And I would have thought about that, that said, like, go and find the stuff in there that might be intriguing and interesting. And then suddenly your thoughts get dwelled into I this. I really like that. We use this analogy called the 1% and trying to find the 1% in everything you do. Yes. So yeah. when we go into a coffee shop and the team goes into a coffee shop, how was the service? Yes, exactly. Did I get a smile? Exactly. My first five guests on this podcast, yeah. <clears throat> I used to send an intern down to collect the guests. And for one evening, I thought to myself, why am <laughs> I sending an intern down to collect the guests in my home? The first person they should be meeting when yeah. walking through my home is me. Yeah. With the smile, and with grace. Yeah. And ever since, that's the 1%. 
is now how can you change it? And I, I love that. It's yeah. going somewhere. Yes, you might have found 95% of it's boring, but find that 1%. Oh, that was good. You know what? Actually, how they did the stairs were good and how we're yeah. backstage. Yeah. You're totally right. And if we put that across, you got me excited. If we put that across yeah. all the all of our careers, yes. what went well in the interview? What did I like about the yeah. reception area? Absolutely. I know. It, it makes a huge difference. And this isn't, this isn't difficult stuff. You know, it's not rocket science. It's actually up to you to determine to actually go ahead and do that. I know this is difficult and it can be challenging, but this is where I say that... That you know, if if you have one thing you got to be aware about, and I think particularly if if you're a younger age because you're more exposed to it, in a way, you got to you got to separate the noise from what's really meaningful, and particularly around social media and other things as well. Get rid of that noise. It's loud. It's in your ears. You see it, and it affects you as well. Be a little bit critical of what you're seeing, and 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 just move it aside. Watch the signal, what really matters in here. And what, what am I going to get out of this in a way where I can make a positive impact? Because I do believe most people want to do that. But separate the noise from the things you're doing. And it's actually, you, you can be quite, uh, you don't need to be thinking, oh my God, I, I need to spend all my time doing it. It's interesting, test and experiment with yourself. Do I get affected by something? Why do I get affected by that? Why does that person have that impact on me? We all come across, you know, sorry for use the language, but we all come across idiots in life. <laughs> you know, people, and what I mean, the people who are ignorant, people who doesn't want you well, mm. people who are bullying or intimidating. But why does that person have the allowance to affect me in that way that they want to do? That's my issue, it's not their issue. And when you start thinking about experimenting about these things and how I react and how I behave of external pressures and people as well, then you realize it's actually up to me to be in yeah. control of this whole thing. Absolutely. Yeah. And how does, how does one, and I, I totally agree with the awareness, uh, be very aware with your surroundings. Those I, I used to say, when you're too close to the elephant, all you see is grey. Sometimes yeah. you have to step away from the elephant yeah. to see all the perspectives. Yeah. Easier said than done as well. But yeah. how can one, how can a young person build awareness and actually know when to speak, know when not to speak, how to greet, and all those things that come into kind of being in with people. Yeah. How can you build awareness? Is it being in with people? Yeah, I, I think it is, uh, you know, get one or two close friends of your people that you trust, and ask them for feedback. Tell them, look, yesterday we were at this event or this party or this meeting, whatever as well, you know, how did I come across? Because you can map out how people that know, you know, watched you, how they say how you came across and how you experience you came across. And you will have sometimes a discrepancy and a gap between in there. And I think about if you're true to yourself, you want to make sure that you have the least possible gap with how people experience you and how you feel and how you want things to be experience with your presence. And I think sometimes when you do, you know, leadership tests and things like that, and when they do so-called 360 tests, when they ask people who work for you, with you, and your bosses, and they ask to characterize yourself, and then you do the same survey, what they're actually looking for there is not so much about what's right and wrong. They're measuring the gaps between how other people view you and how you view yourself, and how you think you're being interpreted. And if it's a large gap, then you need to work on something. If it's the same gap, well, then at least you're in control and you're aware about it. But it won't happen unless you actually take the courage to go to say, look, I, don't worry about offending me here, you know, because I'm curious about myself. I'm curious about, I want to become a better person, be per perceived as a better person. Tell me how I came across at that moment in time. This is how I think, or you don't say that because you shouldn't tell them what you think it was. And that's, that's a relatively easy way to do. And here's the other thing. You have occasions every day when you can practice that. Most people go out to see people there every day. Most go out, people go out and, and do have meetings and they're, they're with friends and you know, there are occasions and you can just try it. Absolutely. So feedback is a gift. Yeah. Build the courage to ask, how can I improve? Yeah. And can I just say on feedback as well, the reason why feedback is, I think, is a gift and it's such a luxury to get because that means ultimately that somebody cares about you. Yeah. 
to spend the time to talk about it. I call it free it. consultancy. It is. It's a luxury. Yeah. You know, I mean, you know, a lot of people why people would be unhappy is because they don't get any recognition. If you're fortunate enough to get feedback, however critical it may be, it is a luxury for you. And actually, feedback is something that happens on the day. That is how you're being perceived on the day. You, you can do <clears throat> test results and you get negative feedback and so on as well, but it's not going to define you forever in your life. You don't need to be you know, constantly worried about that. And I always think about this, this is a, you know, what my grandmother said to me once that, look, you, 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 you got to be able to look yourself in the mirror when you go to bed at night and you're going to say, I did my best what I could today. And the beauty of that is that it's not to say that, look, I did good today or I did bad today. The intention was that I was going to do as good as I could. And some days you, you're not there. You can't say that. And then you then say, okay, well, tomorrow I'm going to have another go at it again. And I'm going to try to be a better person. It sounds grand, but it's actually in the small things. A better, better father to the kids, a better leader, a better husband, whatever that is, a better partner, whatever you describe that as well. Um, and it's, it's intriguing. It you know, is intriguing. Yeah. And talking about feedback, we're going to take a break mm. and you can give me some feedback on my coffee making skills. All right. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll be back in six minutes. So we'll see everyone in under six minutes. Oh, there's nothing clever about selling yourself short. Oh my God. I can't tell you how many people, when you dig into their success stories, look how many failures they had mm -hmm. first. And what marks them out is their character. And you can control your character. You know, how you respond to loss, how you respond mm -hmm. to adversity. And what was the last thing you lost? My job, um, uh, I suppose. You've got to be honest with yourself, what, what went wrong. You've got to then have a realistic plan to put it right. And, you know, bags of determination and self-belief. And the fear of failure, I think you've got to get over that. How do you not let that get to you? I wouldn't say love the adversity, but respect that the adversity will make you better. I've been privileged to see you at various different junctures, and it was very inspiring then, but look how far you've come. It's amazing. <laughs> and if you just relentlessly focused on moving forward, learning the lessons of life, I think it's a recipe for success. And don't let others dictate to you your view of the world, let alone yourself. I said I wanted to be true to my convictions. I wanted to find the right life partner and give my kids the best opportunities I could. Deutsche Bank is the largest bank in the UK that you have never heard of. You know, the environment's very challenging, I think, for young people. Therefore, seek out every opportunity. Don't underestimate how long it's going to take to get up in the morning. <laughs> and I always say, if you're not five minutes early, you're late. I think when anyone is starting a Saturday job and you're a teenager, the biggest thing is getting out of bed. That commitment piece is really important. We know that there are young people for whom actually going to university, spending three, four years, isn't something that they want to do. They want to get out into the world of work immediately. We've got an operations talent program. Lots of different types of ways in which you can actually come into the organisation and understand what's available. So go into a meeting looking for that curious conversation. Absolutely. Then. So I think it's always striking a balance between not sort of interjecting at the wrong times or too frequently, whilst at the same time, if you genuinely have something to say that can add to the conversation and to the discussion, you should absolutely say it. So even though I've been at the bank for 25 years, I feel like I've had five different careers. It's a cliche, but really fake it till you make it. We're looking to grow our businesses. That really is the best advice. Finances can sometimes feel a bit puzzling. Maybe it's that confusing car insurance policy or working out the right protection for your health, home and family. Or feeling unsure if your pension is on the right path? Aviva can help make these conundrums click. Helping 
solve your financial puzzles? It takes Aviva. Is what you're doing still doing it for you? I am EY. For a purpose that inspires me. And a culture that accepts. For a team that relies on me and makes me better for it. Knowing I'm always respected for being absolutely me. For my work to have meaning. Ideas becoming actions and my direction my own. For leaders that challenge, guide and support. Empowering me to be all I can and bring everything I am. My skills accelerated. My voice amplified. For always feeling heard and saying without hesitation. I love what I do. That's why. EY. Mom, I got the job! She got the job! Who got the job? <laughs> She got the job. She got the job. She got the job. She got the job. Find your I got the job job on Total Jobs. I'm so excited, I can't tell you. You know, I just want to scream and shout. Have you ever had an experience where you've gone into a job and thought, oh, what have I done? I felt sick to the pit of my stomach that I've made a bad mistake. I mean, I was ashamed to get a final written warning. And it is the ability to be able to take those, um, those situations and genuinely learn from them without letting them destroy you. Today's news is tomorrow's chip paper. So if it doesn't feel right, if it doesn't look right, it probably isn't right. You know, an awful lot is common sense. And one of the surprising things about common sense is it's not very common. Make your choice, make the choice conscious, and then when you are wherever you are, be present when you're present. Am I learning? Can I have influence? And am I gonna enjoy this? In any situation, there are things you control and there are things you can't control. You've got more control than you realize, but equally, don't fret about the things you can't control, because that is the definition of madness. There's a real lesson there, isn't it? It's find the miracle in every situation. Yeah, yeah. Failure is not fatal. Your ability to bounce back and be resilient, for me, is the thing that has made me who I am. And we're back for the second half. Didn't the first one go quick? It did. It, it goes is amazing. 20 minutes. It's like a time entry in this It does. Scene. Yeah, yeah, it yeah. Does. I, wanna, I know we talked a little bit about mindset and young people starting and moving forward. I want to talk a little bit about the travel industry. I want to start there. Like, yeah. So you got into the travel industry. Yeah. Like, tell me, tell me what was your kind of first learnings in the industry and what didn't you know before? Uh, don't lie. I tell you that because actually there was at the time when I actually got in there. So I told you the story that, that I've been dedicating myself to be a professional musician. I didn't make it, didn't know what to do, sat down and thought, well, what do I like in life? Well, I like people and I like to travel. But I didn't have any education. I, I'd never gone to university as an example. So, so I knew that I was off you know, the radar for many people in terms of how you wanted to get a job in the traditional way. But I thought, okay, travel industry. And I was looking at a paper that was an ad of a large company in Sweden who did um, cruise trips from Stockholm and what was then uh, Leningrad, St. Petersburg in Russia. And they were looking for people, all sorts of qualifications, qualifications was needed. You needed to do this, you needed to speak Russian, you needed to do this and this. I was completely out of it. But the years as a training as a musician, I was very much um, in love with Russian music. So I knew my composers, Rachmaninov, Kostakovich, Rimsky, Korsakov, all, all of that. So I thought I might, I like that. So I'm interested in doing that. But how, I know that if I was sign, you know, writing in to say I send an application, I wouldn't be called on an interview. So I went up to the head office, pretended that I had an appointment, 
that I've been called in by interview, which I didn't have. I, mean, I come from the northern part of Sweden, and the st people in Stockholm consider people from the northern part of Sweden be a little bit not as sharp as nice in the drawer, but trustworthy. So I put on my biggest accent from the northern part and said, I'm here for the two o'clock interview. And of course, they had, didn't have an appointment for me because I, didn't, I wouldn't get that. But then I was a little bit disappointed. I said, well, I come all the way down here from up north and you have lost my papers. And of course, the receptionist in there said, well, we are interviewing right before that position. So I called somebody from HR to come out and I met the person from HR and said, I'm so sorry about that, but let's do the interview anyway. So I got the interview and she said after the interview, you know what, um, this was really interesting. And of course, I can talk about Russia and, and all those type of things as well. She so said, we're going to put you on a test uh, on a cruise. We're going to do a test cruise with some people in there. You're going to be on the cruise. So I went away from there and I felt, you know, excited. I've been street smart. I got this as well and on there. So. And then I started to feel embarrassed. I felt in the evening that, I mean, this is just, I'm, I've been lying here in, into something. I don't feel good about this. I think I called my mother as well and told her. And she said, well, you can't do that. And I felt, no, I can't. So I called up this person the morning afterwards. I said, look, I got to tell you the story. I was, I didn't have an interview appointment with you. I made that up. I just came in and I said, I'm here for the interview. And I didn't. And she was quiet for a while. And she laughed and said, well, look, I booked you on that cruise ship now in the test cruise. So you better come in and you better be good at this. And it was interesting. I then got the job and 30 years later, 25 years later, uh, when I was CEO of that company, it was a different time, she uh, retired and I went to big, did a big speech for her at a retirement about wow. that. So anyway, so don't lie. <laughs> because in the end, this was a good one. But yeah. I think that, you know, you, you sometimes get, you know, caught out in the way of doing it. And actually, you don't need to, to, to lie. It's not a good thing to do. Be honest and be truthful about yourself. And when you do make mistakes, admit them clearly and move on to them, from there. I think that's just brilliant. Yeah. I think that's just brilliant. You shouldn't lie, but you, your curiosity, your get up and go, your drive, your being innovative to get there. Yeah. But then after getting it, owning up that you lied. Yes, yeah. That tells yeah. so much about you as an individual and yeah. your values and as a person. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's, it's, it's down to, and, and I think that everybody come from upbringings where certain things has been in that environment or you have aspired to not. And I think that that was just one of the things that, you know, you were not, you know, you're good enough as you are. You are good enough as you are. You know, it will be okay. You don't have to make it up, you know. But if you're full of ambition, if you're, if you're full of these dreams on what you want to do and you think, ah, oh, can we take a shortcut here and there, but you will be fine out. You will be fine out on the whole thing. So one of the beauties, of course, as you know, to all speaking the truth is you don't have to remember what, you, what, what happened because you know actually what happened because you just have to do that. But uh, anyway. And so for young people listening in who want to be innovative and outrageously creative when it comes to trying to get an interview mm. with not lying. What is your advice to young people? What can they do to get noticed? Because it is, it's easy, it's, it's very difficult when you've got hundreds of people applying for one job mm. or you're trying, you, you really, and we're going to talk a little bit about EasyJet in a bit and I can't yeah. wait, but say for instance I'm applying for a job at EasyJet. Mm. I, would, I've, I don't have a degree my, my CV is, oh, I'm an entrepreneur, yes, I've done some stuff, but I don't think I would get through the door. Well, if you met me, yeah. and I met the recruiter team and stuff, I think I would. Well, there, there's, a, there's a simple way how you would get my attention. And I think you would get everybody's attention if you said, look, I studied your company. I study what you are trying to do in this company. I'm a massive fan, I like that. Here's some things where I would like to contribute because I think I can make it better. And I read up on what that is. A lot of times people come in and they are, they focus too much on, on themselves. You know what I mean? Oh, this is what I can do. This is my thing. And this is what I'm not good at. And this is it feels a little bit rehearsed. But if somebody puts themselves in the position and say that, look, what are they trying to achieve here? 
What are the things that stand? And you got to do more than actually just looking on a website. You got to speak to people. You have you used their, you know, the product, and you've been flying with us as well. You know, take notice on some things as well. Partly because you should be genuinely interested in in any case. Mm -hmm. And if you can get my attention to say, look, here's what I think is so amazing about what you're doing, or not amazing about what you're doing, and 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 here's where I would love to help this become even better. And I can share with you why I think that is the case. And then also sense check to, to get somebody's attention to look at, does this make sense for you? Am I on the right track here? And because there also a lot of people, we talked about that before, they suddenly go into an interview and they have like, you know, three mouths and only one ear. You know, they're so focused on what they're going to need to, you know, tell somebody rather than actually to get an engagement from somebody. To feel that when I have met you, I'm going to walk out of that door and say, look, I, I, I want to be with that person. I, 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 can, I can see that person. I can see Jack being part of this whole thing. And this company will be better with him in it than not with him in it. So if you, if you play that scene up for you, if you do that role play, I mean, I don't do it anymore, but it was a long time in my career where I, I envisaged successful meetings for myself. I talked to people. I, I rehearsed openly and, and you have to have very patient family who listens to when you go over about this as well. So I kind of have pictured this in my mind. So when I got in there, I was prepared for what was going to come or not to come. And that's an easy technique on actually to, to it sounds odd in the beginning when you hear yourself, you know, but, but it's, it's uh, I think it's a technique at least. I'm hearing you loud and clear. Demonstrate the value you can add yeah. when you go into that interview. Look but on just the website. Do yeah. some user testing. Yeah. Look at if you're gonna go into the digital team and you're gonna try and book a flight, see how yeah. it looks or book whatever it is. Mm. And look at the annual report, see the chairmen's yeah. and the CEOs yeah. forward. Yeah. See what they're saying. Look at the yeah. numbers and say, Oh, actually this is how I can add value. Yeah. I, I love that idea. I, I do that. I, I'm doing advisor roles also for um, uh, for a private equity company and um, I always, and when they ask me to look at cases for companies, I always go into the website and do the customer thing. And sometimes I book something, I book a service, I call up as well, and then you do the same thing. You take that experience, and you do it two, three times, and I know it's anecdotal. Mm -hmm. Then you map that out with what the brief is and what the company is saying that they stand for. So you do that and you get the mismatches in there, and that's where you get some learnings going. And if you can use that to say, look, I don't think that what you're trying to achieve here is happening in those places. So what I would like to do is to be able to help you and assist and support and lead you to become better at that. Because that's a pro apparently what you're aspiring to do. And, and how can you say no to that? You can't. No, yeah. you can't. I think that's a brilliant advice yeah. to kind of get in and yeah. kind of get a, get a job. So tell me a little bit about how you landed at EasyJet and yeah. when you first walk through the doors, yeah. like tell me how did you feel and and what have you kind of yeah. done since being there? Because it's 2017 you joined, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean the the, the, the background on that, what I, I in 2015 I uh, I resigned from the job that I was in. I was deputy CEO of was at that time the world's largest travel company, and I actually had decided I was never going to take on a suit again in my entire life. I was becoming 50. The, my children, um, Emma and David, they, they were growing up. I hadn't been with them a lot throughout their upbringing, and I knew I had a, you know, a few years left before they was going to go on and move out to, to university. So I, I really, and I was fortunate, and I had the funds and the money, so I didn't need to work. Um, so I, uh, and then I wanted to get back into the music business. So I, um, I started, which we still have, a, a professional recording studio, a music studio in, in Mallorca, together with my partner, who's a producer. Um, so, so I did that, and I think that's that's what I'm going to do. And I'm going to do some advising here, private equity, or for companies as well. But I was not going to take on a suit again. I was done with my corporate career. Anyway, so this person, this headhunter search firm, calls and said, "Look, this is two years after I left." I said, "Look, uh, you know, surely you want to get back in to become a CEO." I said, "No, I'm I'm done with that, and I I don't want to do that. I, I've done it for such a long time, so I got new things I want to get onto." And then the person said very cleverly. Okay, fine. What company do you admire? What company do you like? What, if you just think about a company that you would 
could consider be part of or leading, mention that company. And I go, EasyJet. Well, that job, there's no job available there. No, I know, but you asked me. And I, I didn't think about that, but it was all about the fact that I thought that EasyJet had added something to an industry that wasn't there before. It was the original democratizer of travel. Before EasyJet, you know, flying was for privileged, rich, wealthy people. And I would have thought that, look, you know, the slogan it had when we started was that, you know, you can fly for the cost less than a pair of jeans. You know, and I also had this as my favorite airline with the family. I thought this is a clever airline and people who work there seem to really to be passionate and enjoy that. Anyway, so nothing happened because the job wasn't available. There was a person in there and that person resigned then six months later. Nothing happened with my conversation. The headhunter calls me up again and said, look, that person is resigned now. You better stand by your word here and go and you know, get into the process in here. And then the, the headhunter had the job then. I was in contact with them and then I got the job. So, so it's a little bit of a story about you know, how, how clever it was that the person said, forget about what you're thinking. Think about something else that, in, you know, that you get excited about and then kind of lured me into, okay, yeah, I want to be part of that. And look, taking that, that fantastic kind of situation that happened and then six months later the opportunity mm -hmm. coming available, young people can do that as well, right? They can look, okay, I really want to work for EasyJet or, and EasyJet's on my list because I've just heard this fantastic My Duvet Flip podcast and yeah. I also want to work for Tesco and they're my two yeah. and there's no vacancies at the moment or I might not be this ready at the moment or when I apply it might, but you add them on your hit list, right? Yeah, you do and here's the other, here's another tip for you that you can either be look at brand names that you can attract. It. You can also, also look at great people to surround yourself with. If you're coming across that, look, that person is just like a force for something I would like to be around. I'm not so, you know, perhaps not too excited about the products that the company is making, but I want to be close to that person because I will learn and I will develop and I want to do that. So you can try to choose your bosses over brands sometimes, or you can choose the brands over bosses sometimes, but you gotta watch out for bad bosses. Bad, okay. bad leadership uh, is, a, is a horrible thing to be exposed to as well. You need to get out of there. I totally agree. Yeah. And what, 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 when a young person's looking out, what, looking out for a bad boss, maybe they just joined a job this week, yeah, they, what, yeah. what, what is the traits that they should be looking out for as a bad boss? They, and then what they, makes a good leader? Cause yeah. positive Let's ones. turn it the other way around. I think that a good leader, and I've been so exposed to so many great leaders, I'm a, I'm a product of people who believed in me very early. And the thing that they had in common, and you have to repay that, is that they, they want you well, they want you to succeed. They're not threatened by your success. They're confident in their own you know, uh, capability to know that actually that person isn't going to threaten me by taking on that and then grow perhaps even beyond myself because I know what I am and what I can do. I'm here and I'm confident enough that. So you got to look at people and I, you know what I mean by confident, not cocky people, but people who are, have a self-esteem is a better word. Mm. They have a greater self-esteem and the value they attribute to themselves is of that type that you can't threaten them. And that's where they become gracious. And that's where they're giving you chances. You have to repay that to say, look, I'm gonna give it my all here. I might not, I'm gonna give it everything I can in order to you know, be a, make a difference into this company as well and go over and beyond that. And when I don't succeed, I'm gonna tell you when I'm failing. And, and you know how it is. If somebody comes to you and say, look, I, I got this you know, assignment in here as well. I'm failing. I, I, I can't come out of it. And I need help on this one. It's not a single person in the right frame of mind doesn't say, well, let's, let's look at it. We'll, we'll sort it out. Mm. I, so, I say, don't blame train. Don't yeah, blame them, one. train them. Yeah, that's right. Exactly. If, they yeah. don't, if they're doing something they don't know, then don't blame them, yeah. train them. Yeah. And it's that kind of concept, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Is when you're a leader. So a good leader is someone who has goodwill and won't be threatened by your nope. ambition or ability. Yeah. And will actually help you get there. Yeah. And also a good leader is somebody who, who gives you, you know, um, we talked about feedback. And they also then not shy away and say, well, that, wasn't, that didn't come across really well. Or that wasn't what we intended to do. We have agreed what we want to achieve, yeah, okay. 
we didn't get there. Why do you think we didn't get there? What do we need to change for the next time on how to do that? So they constructively say, are we in agreement on what you need to achieve, what we should try to do here? Do you have the tools? Do you feel ready? Yeah, okay, go, off you go. And then you say that, look, it didn't work out and we do milestones in here and checklists. Why do you think that is? If you are being defensive to say, oh, it's because of that person, oh, it's he or she or something like that, that won't go down well, will it? If you say, look, I'm failing to come across here with other departments, or I'm, I can't reach in here and get them to do this, or I'm a little bit lost here. Like I said, it's a good lead to say, look, we'll sort this out. Come here, we'll work on this together. And I've been, you know, spoiled with people like that uh, in my career. Ideas and solutions, not people and problems. Yes, exactly, exactly. Yeah, you're right. So tell me a little bit about the EasyJet careers that young people can get involved with. Like, now young people listening in, what kind of career opportunities is there across the business? Because I know there's lots of opportunities yeah. in terms of different pathways that young people can take. What are some of them? Yeah, well, first of all, I think that, you know, EasyJet is a, it is a truly, and I'm very passionate about this, the reason why I joined, I do think that this is a force for good. I think we make, you know, tens of millions of people per year lives better. If we didn't exist, they couldn't fly and connect to friends and families and, and partners and see things for the price that we're offering from the big airports around Europe. It just wouldn't be that alternative. So I think, you know, if you want to work with something where it actually makes a difference for people's lives that people have taken, you know, quite for granted, then, then this is the company for you. If you are also somebody who feels that, look, you know, I want to come in here and I want to be p part and make a difference for something good. We're very eager to improve ourselves every day. So you need to have that learning thing and you need to know that what I did yesterday, that's not going to be my bar today. I'm going to set it higher and you're going to be with like-minded people who want to do that. Doesn't mean we're going to make it work every day. But the mindset has to be on that. So the way we're trying to do this is partly through some kind of you know, formalities that we have around programs. We have um, uh, graduate programs in engineering, finance, uh, management. We have uh, uh, apprenticeship, uh, both in operation roles and also then in, in, in head office roles that we have. We're working together with um, uh, the Luton Council and, and Coastal Capital, where we have some uh, we call it advices where we go out and you know talk to schools about how they can work on people there to become more employable. Mm -hmm. What what types of this? What yeah. are we looking for? Um, and we also try to get into people's uh, minds at a young age. We have this uh, um, you know uh, flight to summer schools where we get you know kids to and parents actually uh, also to think about what is it to be a pilot, go behind the scenes to what it is. Uh, being a pilot because there's a lot of mystery around that and it's i think it's an amazing job as well so we, we're trying to do a lot also to get young girls particularly interested in becoming a pilot uh it, it's a big issue you know we, we the industry can't get you know a female to come and join to the same level we want as, as pilots in there so we don't have a great um, why do you think that is role models role models they don't have that i mean most uh, if you speak to male pilots they would have determined by the time they were Ten that they want to become, you know, pilots. And the people, uh, if you're speaking to 15-year-old girls, they would almost all of them had an uncle or a dad who was a pilot. Uh, so they said, "Well, I can do this." And there's so many myths about this. You know, one is to say, "Well, the working hours doesn't work." You know, well, it's the same working hours as the cabin crew, which is predominantly female. So, so role models is massive to create that to say, look, you know, we got female pilots here, we got women are pilots, girls should aspire to this. It's a great job to do. Um, if you can see it, you can believe it. Absolutely. That type of thing, you know. Do you know what I call them? I don't call them role models. I call them real models. Yeah, that's true. That's actually better. Because a role model can be anyone. Yeah, yeah, that's models. true. Real models actually who walks and who who is actually there. So we so, so we need to get more young women. To become pilots. Yeah, we. You, you know what? And and I, I'm a, I'm a big believer in in. Um, if you're looking at you know the kind of you know inclusion, I, 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 I'm, I'm very. We're very focused on the inclusion part of it, and the diversity will come when you are an inclusive organization. You can't do it the other way around. I've failed miserably mm -hmm. when you've been focusing on diversity targets. Oh, I want six 
percent of this and seven percent of this as well but if you do that and you think you're done if you haven't created that inclusive environment they're mm -hmm. going to go after three months anyway mm -hmm. and the inclusive environment helps the commercial part of the oh, business it does. It and, does. and the share price yeah. go up yeah because what ha absolutely because what happens is if you are in a true inclusive environment where you actually feel psychologically safe that actually i am okay to say i don't agree with you and i think we should do this you can open and you can air the things that you actually feel you can express yourself on who you are what you believe in and you have to do it in a constructive way of course you know that just tells itself that that is much better than anything else. So we want to, and we pay a lot of focus on that, that people need to be able to express themselves. They need to be their best. What's the point otherwise? If I got a workforce of 15,000 people and they're all running at 75% of their capacity, you know, imagine if I get them up to 90% of their capacity. And we all know that that is down to the fact that, look, I feel comfortable, I feel confident that I can express myself in here. But I also need to be mindful about how I come across. Mm -hmm. And if somebody feels that, look, that, that was very hurtful or, or what you did and I experienced like that way, you know, you should immediately say, well, that wasn't my meaning. But I was trying to come across with an opinion. So it's both the fact that you have to be resilient and also accept that people will tell you that mm -hmm. things you might not want to hear. And that 75 to 90 part is the gap that's, that you talked about. That's the gap. Yeah. We've only got a few minutes. Right. You know, we've been speaking for another 23 minutes already. <laughs> We're already going over. This has been fantastic. There's a mirror behind me. And uh, what would you be telling your 21-year-old self? If you could go back and talk to your 21-year-old self from your lessons that you know now as a CEO of the largest airlines, like what would you be saying? When I was 21? Yeah. Don't be so damn hard on yourself. <laughs> it will sort itself out. So don't be, don't take yourself too seriously. Don't take yourself. So, yeah, it, it. I was full of ambition and drive and and energy and and I thought that look the things that that didn't work out for me on a particular day. I thought that that was going to be, you know, oh that will live with me for a while. But you know, it, it it doesn't. First of all, you're not you're not as important as you think you're in people's eyes. When you, when you think that oh I made a fool of myself, you're the one who remembers that. And after a while, if you make mistakes along your way journey, you're going to forget them as well. So it's not. So I, I would say, you know, it will be all right. It will be okay. What you're experiencing in your bad days, that's not going to define you. It's that old saying: today's news is tomorrow's chip paper. Exactly. Exactly. It is. It is so true. And my final, final question mm -hmm. is: What's your duvet flip? What gets you out of bed in the morning to flip the duvet? I think the the idea that I can be better than yesterday it's, that that excites me and also that i got learnings to do today i can have a day when i think oh that that's not oh my thoughts say oh that doesn't look like a great day and then i think about this advice they got about you know find the things in here that excite you and suddenly you think about oh well, i'm meeting that person well that's worthwhile getting up for well i'm doing this or i'm having this and then suddenly all the other things that your thoughts were overwhelmed with at some point as well, that excite you, that goes away. Absolutely. And I just want to say thank you for your time, your energy, for joining on the show and just being such a great storyteller. <laughs> I'm smiling. And, uh, and young people, don't lie when you go to interviews uh, and find the way around it. And I just You're good enough as you are. You are good enough as yes. you are. And uh, just want to say thank you so much for your thank time. Thank you so much for having me. can sometimes feel a bit puzzling. Maybe it's that confusing car insurance policy or working out the right protection for your health, home and family. Or feeling unsure if your pension is on the right path. Aviva can help make these conundrums click. Helping solve your financial puzzles? It takes Aviva. Is what you're doing still doing it for you? I am EY. For a purpose that inspires me. And a culture that accepts. 
For a team that relies on me, it makes me better for it. Knowing I'm always respected for being absolutely me. For my work to have meaning, ideas becoming actions and my direction my own. For leaders that challenge, guide and support, empowering me to be all I can and bring everything I am. My skills accelerated, my voice amplified. For always feeling heard and saying without hesitation, I love what I do. That's why EY. Mom, I got the job! She got the job! Who got the job? Granny! She got the job! She got the job! She got the job! Find your I got the job job on Total Jobs. Mom.